Hey guys, it's Christian. This is going to be a complete retrospective of the entire MCU Infinity Saga. Marvel Phases 1 through 3 are definitely some of my favorite movies of all time. And I know we have Phases 4 and we're going through Phase 5 and we're going to have Phase 6. But in my mind, I really feel like Phases 1 through 3 are really the real canon MCU, where the real heart of the story is, so I really wanted to go through those. And since it's been a little over 5 years since the release of Avengers Endgame, I thought this would be a really fun opportunity to go through Phases 1 through 3 and just kind of remember all the good times we had with those movies. And for this video, it's not going to be beat for beat of every single movie. It's mostly going to be about the storylines, characters, and themes that kind of tie into the overall Infinity Saga and the continuity that kind of went from movie to movie. And lastly, this video will contain spoilers, so if you haven't seen any of the movies from phases one through three, then I highly suggest watching those movies first and then coming back to this video. But well, some of them are the highest grossing films of all time, so how can you miss them? And they're all streaming on Disney Plus, so yeah, go ahead and watch those. So without further ado, let's jump in. So first up we have Iron Man, and this is definitely one of my favorite movies of all time. Not just one of my favorite superhero movies or Marvel movies, just my favorite just movies of all time. It's definitely the movie that obviously established the entire MCU, established the Avenger Initiative, has established all the different characters, especially with Tony Stark, played by Robert Downey Jr., who is definitely one of the craze factors of all time. You know, he just won the Oscar for Oppenheimer, which he's really great in. So yeah, there's definitely like a lot of pressure to, you know, get this movie right. I know a lot of like the studio was like really kind of hesitant on getting Robert Downey Jr for the role of Iron Man, especially, you know, with all this, like, drug problems and everything like that. I mean, he was always, like, a fantastic actor, but, you know, that was always, like, the kind of issue that Marvel had. But, you know, they bet on him and they won, and he's definitely, like, one of the faces of the MCU through phases one through three, and, you know, he's definitely made, you know, a lasting impression on audiences and everything. So, yeah, we can kind of just, like, jump into the different characters that have been introduced. We have Tony Stark slash Iron Man, Rhodey, you know, paid by Terrence Howard, and, you know, obviously he'll get replaced by Don Cheadle in the future, but we'll get to that in a second. Pepper Potts, played by Gwyneth Paltrow and a bunch of all like minor characters as well you know we have Agent Phil Coulson we have Jarvis who obviously becomes very important moving forward and then we also have S.H.I.E.L.D. being referenced and then eventually at the very end of the credits with Nick Fury you know yeah we can just yeah, jump right into that with the whole Avenger initiative you know this movie it's kind of establishing the whole world of superheroes you know with Tony Stark being this kind of like weapon specialist and then him being attacked by his own weaponry due to the betrayal of Obadiah Stane wanting to take over the company and then you know him being captured and taken to the cave in Afghanistan and being able to build a suit in a cave with a box of grabs. You know, that iconic line from Obadiah Stain and, you know, being able to put on the suit and, you know, fight his way out of the cave and want to become a hero instead of using his weapons to better be feared or respected. You know, is it too hard to ask for both? And using his skills to protect the world, you know, which is a great idea. And the world is starting to take notice of this. And then obviously, you know, the very end where Tony Stark reveals that he's Iron Man, you know, has the iconic line. Truth is, I'm Iron Man. And then everyone bursting with their questions and everything like that, like what's going on. You know, that was really like, you know, a standout moment of the movie where previously different superheroes never revealed their secret identity to the world. So this is definitely kind of like a landmark moment in the world of superheroes. And then, you know, obviously the repercussions that come from that, you know, that we get into previous movies. And then, you know, we get to the end credit scene with Nick Fury in Tony Stark's apartment and then telling him that it's like, I like to talk to you about the Avenger initiative, you know, which is the Avenger initiative, not the Avengers initiative, which a lot of people get that line confused by. But yeah, now the the whole world is now open to the idea of superheroes you know now he's not the only superhero in the world because you know the whole like timeline thing at least as far as like the sequel to Iron Man 2 it simultaneously takes place with the Incredible Hulk and with Thor so all these things are happening at the same time and then obviously previously we had previously established characters you know like Captain America in like 1940s and then Captain Marvel in the 1990s well then we'll get to those films in a second but yeah obviously a great start to the whole MCU and then oh yeah another Easter egg is like the name drop of the Ten Rings the captors that capture Tony and then put him into the cave. You know, that obviously becomes very important later on, especially in Iron Man 3. And then, you know, I know it, obviously it's very important in Shang-Chi and The Legend of the Ten Rings, but, you know, we won't talk about Phase 4, even though I like that movie, but, you know, this is just about the Phase 3 movies. So it's really fun that they kind of name drop that. But yeah, overall, great movie. Like I said before, like one of my favorite movies of all time. And yeah, just does a great job at establishing the tone for the MCU, even though there's a lot of stuff in it that's really not really like Disney friendly, but, you know, Disney finally got the distribution rights in 2013. So these earlier Marvel movies, you know, definitely more adult, not really as family friendly as, you know, the later ones, which is totally fine. But overall, great movie and yeah, great start to the MCU. All right. And then we move on to The Incredible Hulk. And yeah, this is definitely kind of like the forgotten child of the MCU. At first, like no one really talks about it until, you know, later on where a lot of characters from this movie get reintroduced later. You know, like Thaddeus Thunderbolt Ross gets reintroduced in Civil War. And then a lot of characters apparently are going to be returning. You know, like Emil Blonsky, you know, was in She-Hulk, which definitely was my favorite. 
favorite, but you know, we won't talk about that one. Thank goodness Betty Ross and Samuel Stearns are going to be returning in Captain America Brave New World. So we'll see how they turn up in those movies. But yeah, this was kind of like the movie that no one really remembered. Universal had the rights to this one, so it can be streamed on Disney Plus until like recently, until like you know, last year. <laughs> so people kind of skipped over this movie. No one really talked about it. You know, obviously Edward Norton was the main character, played Bruce Banner, and then he got replaced by Mark Ruffalo, who stayed in the role later on. So it's definitely didn't really have that kind of staying power that you know a lot of people really wanted it to be but overall i think it's like you know like a fun movie you know it's definitely better than the ang lee version which is definitely a quieter introspective version of hulk where this is more of like comic accurate version of hulk where you know it's like the hulk smash and everything like that we finally get you know battles between hulk and abomination even though it kind of looks like a big cgi video game fest but you no know, hey it's better than nothing so, so yeah i think it's uh, overall pretty good and yeah there's not really too many elements that really like tied into the overall infinity saga the only most important things is you know the whole establishment of the whole super soldier program yeah i know we'll get more into it in captain america but technically out of the release order of the films like this is the first time it's mentioned where in captain america's time they had the whole super soldier program and you know obviously they only had like one test subject who was successful which is steve rogers but you know he went down in the ice so that is thunderbolt ross is trying to restart the whole super soldier program again but kind of disguise it as like humans resistance to radiation so bruce banner volunteers for the project and then obviously gets exposed by the gamma radiation and then, you know, becomes the Hulk. So that's kind of like the whole intro. And then, you know, after that's kind of like a whole like on the run movie. And then, you know, obviously Bruce Banner's whole goal is to find like a cure for this thing. But then when he meets with Samuel Stearns, the only answer he has is that he'll be able to control himself after, you know, he hulks out, you know, he will transform back into Bruce Banner a little bit more easily, which definitely gets established more in Avengers where Bruce Banner returns to the screen. You know, obviously a different actor, but you know, Oh well. <laughs> but yeah, and then we have the whole end fight where after Samuel does the experiments on Bruce, he's able to kind of control his rage, control his anger, and then kind of uses that in the third act to defeat Emil Blonsky slash Abomination, and then goes on the run again to, you know, control his emotions, and now he's in control of it, and then you know, we get the payoff in the Avengers. But yeah, honestly, there's not really too many tie-ins to the overall MCU. The only real thing is like, it's not even a post credit scene. It comes like right before the credits where Tony Stark visits Thaddeus Thunderbolt Ross in the bar and tells him that he's putting a team together and then obviously that implies as being the Avengers. So that's really the only tie-in for that. And then, you know, obviously Bruce comes back for the Avengers, but yeah, like overall, The Incredible Hulk, so you know, it's fine movie, but yeah, there's not really too many larger MCU tie-ins and, you know, it's kind of one you can skip over and then, you know, you can just watch Avengers with the Hulk in it where, you know, he's kind of a little bit more of an improvement. So yeah, kind of like overall thoughts on Incredible Hulk. Then we get into Iron Man 2 and this is kind of like, I guess, the beginning of somewhat of a downturn for the MCU, you know, kind of started off a high with Iron Man that kind of went down a little bit with Incredible Hulk and it's kind of going down more with Iron Man 2. You know, it's not a terrible movie, you know, rewatching it, you know, it's not as bad as I remember it being because it was definitely one of my these favorite movies because like I said before Iron Man was like one of my favorite movies of all time so then when you get Iron Man 2 as being a step down you know it's kind of like a little disappointed by it I mean overall yeah I think it's pretty fun you know, there's definitely a lot of like essential things going on in it you can tell that Marvel's trying to race against time to get to the Avengers so they kind of sacrifice the story and character a little bit in order to kind of shoehorn a bunch of MCU tie-in stuff you know which will definitely happen a lot more in later movies where the director has their own vision for the story and then Marvel and the studio is trying to like shoehorn their own kind of larger MCU ideas in it so this is kind of one of them one of the things was like the whole Stark Expo which wasn't like you know like a huge thing but I think it was really cool that it kind of gets set up in this movie and then gets brought back later on in Captain America where Howard Stark another big character Howard Stark is introduced in this one played by John Slattery who's you know a great actor has the first established Stark Expo in Captain America Civil War during like the 1940s and then Tony Stark is bringing it back here which when I first saw that he was just gonna be like a little cameo in the MCU but yeah he actually becomes like pretty prominent character in the storyline, you know, has a lot of appearances throughout the MCU, which I thought was really cool. And then we also get, you know, other pretty big characters as well. You know, we get Natasha Romanoff, who's in this one is Natalie Rushman, but then gets revealed later on that her real name is Natasha Romanoff, who turns out to be Black Widow, which in this movie, you know, she's kind of just like, and, you know, she's obviously, you know, the eye candy, you know, the kick butt, you know, action hero and everything like that who doesn't really have much personality. But I'm glad that Joss Whedon gave her a lot more three-dimensional personality in Avengers, but, you know, we'll get to that in a second. And then obviously we get James Rhodes as War Machine, finally. <laughs> we have that joke in Iron Man 1 where, you know, Terrence Howard looks at the silver Mark II Iron Man armor and he's all like, next time, baby. But then the little joke is like, well, it's not you because, you know, obviously gets replaced by Don Cheadle, which, you know, I have a 
whole tangent about that, but won't go into that. So Rhodey finally dons the silver Iron Man suit, and then obviously that evolves into the official War Machine armor, which he'll use throughout the series, and then, you know, obviously gets refined more and more as the series of movies goes on. But that's really cool seeing him finally in the armor, and then they're kind of like friends, but then they kind of butt heads during the midpoint, and then they kind of go their separate ways, but then they come back, and then they're both the two Iron Men going against all those, you know, drones created by Ivan Benko, who's seeking revenge on Tony Stark with the whole fallout that both their fathers had when they were inventing the arc reactor. So it's kind of cool seeing that whole full circle thing. But yeah, they defeat Fenko, they defeat the Iron Drones, they defeat, you know, Justin Hammer, who's trying to shut down Iron Man's whole superhero thing going on and kind of prove that, you know, the world doesn't need Iron Man. They need soldiers who can, like, have their own armor and, you know, protect the world instead of, you know, relying on this one guy. So, you know, he gets his comeuppance. And then Tony Stark, at the very end, gets recruited by Nick Fury to work for him for S.H.I.E.L.D., but only as a consultant not as Iron Man so I thought that was a really fun twist as well obviously a lot of kind of race against time in order to get to the Avengers and obviously we have that post credit scene of Coulson you know getting that call to go out to the New Mexico desert and then you know he sees a hammer in the middle of the desert and you know obviously that's going to be the setup for Thor so yeah overall yeah it's like pretty okay movie you know definitely not my favorite definitely prefer the first one but I do see like the essential elements that have to be put in this movie in order to get us to Avengers but it'd been nice to kind of get just an official just Iron Man sequel and not really worry too much about the time in, or just not really have this movie and just go from Iron Man to Avengers, but you know overall it's all right all right then we move on to thor and yeah another good one i feel like this is kind of like an upswing for marvel you know it's not the best movie but you know it's starting to get a little bit better obviously it's the introduction to several new characters thor loki odin frigga the warriors three sif heimdall jane foster darcy selvig as much as people might not love this movie which you know i, mean, I don't love it but you know i think it's a fine movie i think it does a good job of you know establishing more of the fantastical side of marvel because you know with like iron man incredible hulk iron man 2 they're kind of more on like the science side you know a lot of people were wondering like how are they gonna have Thor and Iron Man in the same movie with Avengers Luckily, you know Kenneth Braun didn't really have to worry about that he kind of just had to worry about making it just a good Thor movie I mean the only, the only downside about it is that you know I kind of wish that it was just an actual Thor movie you know it really takes place you know in Asgard you know I know we kind of get that more with Thor the Dark World but I, I kind of wish we just had an adventure in Asgard where you know Thor has to learn how to be you know selfless and care more about other people instead of having it be you know the first like 20 minutes of him you know being you know a God and then being banished to Earth for, you know, an hour or so. And then finally the last 20 minutes, he's back to being a godlike being and everything like that. So yeah, it's kind of the only downside with that. But yeah, overall, I think it's like a really fine movie. Definitely establishes a lot for the MCU, builds the relationships that will further us into the MCU, especially the relationship between Thor, Loki, and Odin. Odin being the father of these two kids and then them growing up, you know, wanting the throne. So they're kind of, you know, being bred to oppose each other. I also, you know, enjoy talking Tom Hiddleston's performance as Loki. He could have been like the stereotypical mustache twirling villain, but I'm glad they kind of gave him more empathy. Plot twist is that he's actually, you know, a frost giant who was taken from his home and then raised by Odin. And, you know, the only thing that he wants to do in life is, you know, please his father. And, you know, one of the things is like getting rid of Thor because obviously Thor is very much a danger to Asgard, as we saw in like the opening scene where, you know, he almost incites a whole war. But yeah, I'm glad they gave him more like, empathy and kind of give him more of a motivation for, you know, when he eventually does become the villain in Avengers. Well, he wasn't wanting to please his father and then his father at the very end is like no Loki you know when Loki tries to take over Asgard after Thor's been banished and then Odin's been put into Odin's sleep tries to wipe out Jotunheim and then eventually you know tries to wipe out Thor so yeah we definitely do the, give that empathy and then you know that kind of sets the stage for Avengers you know I kind of wish that Loki actually you know died died but you know that'll become a theme as the movies go on of like Loki coming back from the dead several times and you know causing more chaos so you know he kind of dies and then kind of comes back at the very end where Nick Fury is inviting Selvig into shield and then reveals the Tesseract or the Cosmic Cube which ends up being the Space Stone later on for the Infinity Stones and Loki's kind of taking over Selvig's mind and saying like oh well that's worth a look so we kind of get that whole establishment of how Loki's going to play into Avengers and how Selvig and how Nick Fury are going to play into the Avengers so yeah overall I think it's an essential movie it's definitely not the best Marvel movie but you know there's definitely a lot of essential elements in this movie that kind of lead us into future Avengers movies so I give a, a pass for that and then we move on to Captain America the First Avenger and yeah this is definitely one of my favorite Marvel movies you know definitely not as much as the first Iron Man movie but yeah I like this one a lot Captain America is my personal favorite character in the MCU especially you know he has the best trilogy of films in my opinion and I think a lot of people as well so I think this is a really good movie to kind of set up his character instead of the whole world that he's involved in you know that he eventually leaves in the end and then gets you know woken up in modern day time
times. So yeah, it's a really good way to establish Steve Rogers' character. I think one of the best parts of the movie is, you know, skinny Steve, you know, where you have either his body shrunken down with CGI or they kind of put his head on like a skinny guy's body. But I think it looks like really convincing, especially for 2011. I think it still holds up pretty well. But the whole point is that, you know, you're supposed to care about Steve, you know, when he's skinny and then when he comes to Captain America, Steve, you know, you still care about him because he still has the same heart that he has when he was, you know, skinny Steve. But yeah, it's like, you know, obviously like a great cast of characters as well. We obviously have Red Skull, who becomes essential, you know, way down the line in Adventures in Fendi War. We have Peggy Carter, who becomes very essential later on as well and kind of gets brought up throughout the movies too. Obviously, Bucky Barnes becomes a big character in the Captain America movies and eventually the entire MCU. Other minor characters, you know, like Arnim Zola, becomes very important later on in Winter Soldier. So again, this is like another movie that, you know, is very like essential, just like Thor and Iron Man 2. Iron Man T, oh, oh, not Iron Man 2, <laughs> where it introduces a bunch of different characters who will become important later on and really help out the MCU overall. And kind of like what I was saying before with the Incredible Hulk, where we're actually seeing the Super Soldier program or seeing Skinny Steve, you know, get injected by the Super Soldier serum and then hit by the Vita Rays and becoming Captain America Steve and, you know, finally becoming a hero. And I think it's really cool seeing his evolution as the story goes on because, you know, at first you think he's going to be like the hero that the world needs, but then, you know, he becomes, you know, like a dancing monkey in a way you know he's just kind of used for like advertisements to promote war bonds and you know it's definitely not what he wanted to do but then you know he finally gets that mission where Bucky and a lot of the Howling Commandos are captured and he decides to go rogue with Howard Stark and Peggy in order to find them and then finally proves himself to being the hero you know being Captain America and then as this story goes on you'll know, get the uniform gets the vibranium shield you know the establishment of vibranium they don't say like where it comes from which you know obviously gets revealed in Black Panther later on but yeah Blanks the shield, you know, finally becomes a hero. He's meant to be battles Red Skull at the very end for control of the Tesseract Cosmic Cube, which got established in the previous movie of Thor. And this is kind of like, you know, the MacGuffin of this movie. And, you know, Red Skull tries to capture that, harness its power in order to establish Hydra, which becomes, you know, a very important plot point throughout the movies as well. Johann Schmidt is trying to start this Hydra program in order to be better than Nazis, you know, take over the world. And then obviously we have Captain America being the hero who has to stop him. They have that big battle at the end. Red Skull tries to take the Tesseract and then he gets teleported to who knows where but then it gets established in Infinity War that he got sent to Vormir and became the stone keeper for the Soul Stone which we'll get to way later down the road but yeah I know I was one of the people who thought he just died or just got teleported and you know we would never see him again but I know I had a lot of friends who was like oh yeah I think Red Skull's gonna come back I'm like I don't know but then you know obviously I was wrong and he came back so it was kind of cool re-watching and seeing Red Skull didn't die he just got transported and then obviously you know Captain America has to sacrifice you know puts the plane which has all the bombs that are gonna you know go to the different place in the world to destroy them lands in the water people think he's dead but he's actually you know frozen and then he gets discovered 70 years later by shield and then you know gets recruited to the avengers and then obviously that leads us right into avengers with the post credit scene of basically the trailer for the avengers but yeah now we have like all of our heroes are established obviously they have their different personalities their different worlds their different groups of people that they interact with so it's going to be interesting seeing how they all come together as a team to take on this ultimate threat of loki and people that he's working for and that leads us right into the Avengers and you know right off the bat we get the whole introduction of the other talking to Thanos who doesn't get named in this movie but now we know who main bad guy of the MCU is going to be who's going to be established throughout the rest of the MCU we get established of the whole Chitauri army their weapons their vehicles and everything which become way important later down the line and their whole plan to use Loki in order to destroy the earth and then you know destroy Earth's mightiest heroes and then have a way for Thanos to you know, take over the universe. I think one thing that's interesting is the fact that they're kind of giving Loki the scepter with the Mind Stone in it when obviously it gets revealed later on that Thanos needs the Mind Stone in order to activate the Infinity Gauntlet. So like, why are you giving Loki an Infinity Stone in order to retrieve an Infinity Stone? Obviously, you know, they didn't know that these different random objects were going to be Infinity Stones. You know, they didn't really know what they were going to do. Infinity War, you know, when Joss Whedon was writing the script, he just had Thanos as like one little Easter egg at the very end of the credits for all the fans and everything like that. And then Kevin Feige and Marvel saw how everyone responded to it. It was like, okay, now that's going to be phases two and three is we're going to lead up to Infinity War and Infinity Gauntlet storyline. So I thought that was really interesting. But yeah, we get establishment of more Infinity Stones. Obviously the Tesseract, which ends up being the Space Stone, which is like the MacGuffin for the Avengers. And then the Scepter, which has the Mind Stone in it, which obviously gets very important later on. And then basically the whole recruiting of the team, you know, we get all these different characters that are kind of from the disparate positions. We also get reintroduced the character of Hawkeye, who was previously established in Thor. It's a little camp scene you know when I watched it didn't really think he was going to be important 
and then obviously you know now he is so i think that's really really cool but then you know he gets put under mind control which you know a lot of people were just like oh man like i thought he was gonna be on the team the whole time but like most of the movies under mind control and then at the very end he joins the avengers but yeah yeah overall this is like one of my favorite movies of all time one of my favorite avengers movies probably like my second favorite avengers movie just because it was just such an anomaly in industry establishing all these different characters in these different movies and then having all them come together in one big crossover movie i know there's been crossover movies in the past but like there's nothing that's been to this extent before so it was really cool seeing you know on the big screens like oh my gosh like tony stark and iron man talking to each other like what so yeah overall yeah i thought that was really really cool but yeah then we get introduced to like a bunch of different elements of the story you know we get introduced to the helicarrier once all the heroes are together and the helicarrier will become very important later on in different movies and then you know obviously the characters are like all bickering and everything and you know obviously the helicarrier is like part aircraft carrier part helicopter can kind of fly and cloak itself and everything the different characters are recruited you know iron man hulk captain america thor black widow in order to stop loki who has the scepter who stole the tesseract in the opening scene and you know killed a bunch of people and took barton under mind control so their whole mission is to come together to stop them nick fury finally activates the avenger initiative which he brought up at the end of iron man so all these characters come together they obviously butt heads a lot but then as the story goes on they learn to work together we get the death of colson which is a very tragic scene you know we had him interacting with thor and iron man and all these different characters you know steve rogers at the beginning in order to have the characters you know care about him so then when he gets killed that gives the character something to avenge obviously the avengers they finally come together they defeat loki who's trying to use the tesseract to open the portal because it's a space stone to have thanos's army come down they have the cool epic shot of like the camera going around all the characters as they're like circled together which is definitely a callback throughout the series and then the world security council which gets established in this movie who's kind of like nick fury's boss orders him to you know send a, a nuke to bomb new york but obviously nick fury doesn't want to do that so then iron man grabs a missile takes it into the wormhole and then it hits the mothership the mothership gets destroyed and then all the chitauri you know fall down you know phantom menace style on the ground and then the day is saved thanks to the avengers and after that they kind of go their separate ways thor takes loki back to asgard to face justice steve rogers black widow hawkeye you know they continue to work for shield tony and bruce banner kind of drive off into the sunset you know as the science bros yeah overall fun movie great establishment of these characters great establishment of the team and you know obviously became a pop culture worldwide phenomenon and like i said before we get the little teaser at the end of thanos being introduced into the world and you know the other saying to challenge them is to court death and then you know thanos you know turning and then giving that little grin and that's the conclusion of phase one and then we kind of go into phase two And we move on to Iron Man 3, and this is probably like my, yeah, my second favorite Iron Man movie. I definitely like it more than Iron Man 2, but not as much as Iron Man 1. Yeah, this is kind of like an interesting time for Marvel. I feel like the first couple of movies of Phase 2 just weren't really as good as, you know, the later ones, and they weren't really as essential. You know, like Iron Man 3 is very much kind of like a self-contained story. There's not really too many tie-ins to the overall Infinity Saga. It's really kind of just its own thing, which is fine. You know, it's just like a fun, you know, action thriller, so I think it's really cool. One of the only things that kind of carries over from Avengers is that Tony's reeling from the events of the Avengers where you know the wormhole opened up and he like he went into it to destroy the Chitauri mothership and now he has like all this PTSD and you know panic attacks from it so you know he kind of like uses that time where he has insomnia to build more Iron Man suits and you know obviously putting a strain on his and Pepper's relationship so it's kind of like he has to kind of choose between you know his relationships or between his work and you know that's kind of one of the whole conflicts that he faces and then obviously the main conflict that he has is you know the whole reveal of the mandarin who's like the true leader of the ten rings but kind of like i said before with shang chi and the legend of the ten rings you know, obviously that's not the real mandarin you know, we get like two fake mandarins we get ben kingsley playing trevor slattery who spoiler alert, if you haven't seen it he turns out to just be an actor which you know was definitely a bummer when i first watched the movie but then re-watching it now it's like okay now that i know that the twist is coming you know it's not as bad it's still kind of dumb but still funny and then we also have that marvel one shot where trevor slattery is taken to prison and then he's interrogated by that Asian who tells him that the real Mandarin's out there, he doesn't want you to use his name, and then you know, so we get introduced to the real Mandarin in Shang-Chi and Legend of Ten Rings, which is a great movie and a great way to address that. And it's kind of funny that they actually have Trevor Slattery in that movie, but this is about the Infinity Saga, so we'll stick with that. And then we obviously get introduced to the other fake Mandarin, Aldrich Killian, who's like kind of like a disabled science nerd in a way who's trying to 
tell Tony Stark about you know all of his plans and everything like that. But then you know Tony just shut him down. And then as the years went on, he kind of tried to seek revenge, clean himself up, he established the AIM program, established the Extremis program, along with Rebecca Hall's character, and you know kind of take her work. And then he has fire powers and everything like that. The fun line from Rhodey is like, "You breathe fire." Okay, but you know, obviously Tony defeats him as you know he does with all the bad guys. He tries to threaten Pepper Potts with the powers. He tries to inject her with the extremis to have her blown up due to the instability of it. But then she uses that power to defeat Aldridge. She kind of has like the Iron Man arm and fights Aldrin. So it's kind of like a Easter egg to when she becomes rescue in Endgame. So I thought that was pretty cool. And then Tony finally has the surgery to remove the shrapnel from his heart. You know he destroys all of his Iron Man suits. Like half an hour into the movie, you know his mansion gets destroyed. So he kind of just like takes his old arc reactor throws into the ocean and then drives away but you know you can take away his suits you can take away his home you can take away everything but you know in the end he's still iron man so yeah overall it really is just kind of like a self-contained story i mean yeah there's some essential elements to it but there's not really too much going on for the overall mcu but yeah, i mean it's still overall fine movie and we can move on to thor the dark world which you know another downswing for marvel i think this is probably considered you know the worst movie in the mcu i mean i think i have the unpopular opinion which i, I don't think it's that bad it's definitely not great i don't think it's great or anything and it's probably my second least favorite thor movie right before thor love and thunder but yeah like i said there's some essential elements to it i mean obviously the biggest one is the establishment of the ether which ends up being the reality stone and that's kind of like a way for jane foster to get back into the story i didn't really care for the love story in thor you know it's really like they, these two fall in love after just a long weekend just because you know they're both attractive and everything and you know thor obviously had abs and everything like that so it's kind of like it's really essential to have like these two back together i think it'd be really cool if thor actually got together with Sif, which, you know, they hint at a lot throughout this movie, but you know, obviously it won't happen, but, you know, all well. But yeah, so then Jane, you know, gets infected by the ether, and then this kind of, like, reawakens Malekith the Dark Elf, so it's a whole battle of the Asgardians against the Dark Elves, and then Thor has to bring Jane to Asgard in order to heal her, and then, you know, Malekith is after her. I guess another essential thing is the death of Frigga, Thor and Loki's mother, you know, at the hands of Malekith, so that kind of motivates Loki, who's been in prison in Asgard, you know, for his crimes after the events of Avengers to work together with Thor in order to defeat Malekith, stop him from using the ether to cause chaos during the convergence and destroy all the Rhyme Realms. But you know, obviously the whole happy ending of them destroying Malekith, you know, concealing the ether into a reality stone, which we don't see, which kind of gets joked in Endgame. Obviously we have the tragic scene of Loki's death. Again, we think he's dead, but then he ends up being alive and then he impersonates Odin. And then that storyline kind of gets continued in Thor Ragnarok, which we'll get to later on and then rejects the offer to become king and then chooses to be an avenger instead and then you know get the whole reveal that odin is actually loki sing on the throne it's like oh thank you brother so yeah overall it's just kind of another self-contained moral movie this is kind of like the time during the mcu where i was kind of getting a little nervous i'm like oh shoot is this what the mcu is going to be moving forward but then you know obviously things get a lot better with the next movie which we'll get to in a second but yeah overall for the dark world is definitely a low point for the mcu but i'm glad it kind of has an upswing after that and then we move on to Captain America Winter Soldier, which is definitely one of my top three Marvel movies of all time. If you want to see like my full thoughts on it, I have a video of me kind of reviewing all the Russo Brothers MCU movies so you can get my full thoughts on that. But for this section, I just wanted to talk about the things that tie into the overall MCU. You know, obviously, we get new characters that get introduced. We have Brock Rumlow, who turns into Crossbones later on in the next Captain America movie. We have Sharon Carter, who is the niece of Peggy Carter, who becomes like a romantic interest for Captain America. We have the introduction of the Winter Soldier, who later gets revealed as Bucky Barnes. That's a whole plot twist in the whole movie, is that this kind of Winter Soldier has been used to assassinate all these different people throughout history you know, since the 1940s. And then the whole like big twist of Hydra secretly running within S.H.I.E.L.D. and the whole thing of you know Captain America were like Widow and Nick Fury and Maria Hill to take down Hydra within S.H.I.E.L.D. and you know, just take down S.H.I.E.L.D. in general. And the whole reveal that Winter Soldier is actually Bucky Barnes. And then another blink and you miss it, Easter egg is that when Black Widow and Captain America go on the run from the S.H.I.E.L.D. agents, they go back to Camp Lehigh and they find out that Arnim Zola was actually still alive the whole time. You know, he put his memories into a machine, you know, kind of ghost machine kind of thing. And then, you know, as he's kind of flashing to all the different moments that Hydra has had over the years, you know, they see like an assassination of Tony's parents at the hands of the Winter Soldier. And then, you know, obviously like a very important plot point in Civil War. So it's definitely one of those blinking miss it kind of things that 
I didn't really notice like the first time I watched it, but then, you know, watching Civil War and then rewatching this one, you know, years ago when that movie was coming out, it's like, oh my gosh, they do kind of establish that. So it's kind of this whole secret that Steve Rogers is holding from Tony. It's the fact that he knows that Buggy Barnes killed Tony's parents. So I thought that was a really cool Easter egg for sure. And then we also get introduced to the character of Sam Wilson slash Falcon, who obviously becomes a big character later on in the movies as they go on. It's really cool seeing their whole dynamic. And then later on at the very end of Endgame, where, a spoiler, Cap hands over the shield to Sam Wilson to become the new Captain America. Then obviously he's going to get his own movie in Captain America Brave New World. I think that was really cool to establish this relationship. But yeah, overall, really, really cool character. And then we kind of get to the whole end battle as Steve Rogers and Bucky are fighting. Steve refuses to fight Bucky. And it's like, I'm with you to the end of the line. And that kind of triggers Bucky's memories. Obviously, they have the whole kind of Project Insight of three different helicarriers with a list of targets of people who could become potential threats. And one of the names is Stephen Strange, who obviously becomes Doctor Strange in his movie later on. But again, I thought this was just like a fun Easter egg, but it's like, oh no, he's actually going to be an established character later on. So it's kind of cool seeing that. So we have Steve disabling all the chips so that all the cannons kind of turn on themselves and they fire each other. And then, you know, obviously they fall into the ocean and then Bucky saves Steve, you know, pulls him out of the ocean because, you know, Steve could have just drown and got killed. But since now he's reawakened as Bucky Barnes, he saves him and kind of goes on the run, goes to that memorial later on in the post credit scene and then sees himself, you know, as like a World War One hero and how he like perished in that. So that kind of like starts the process of him being rehabilitated. And obviously that gets very important in Captain America Civil War, but obviously we'll get to that in a second. But yeah, overall, great movie, great action, great tension. Again, if you want to see my full thoughts, watch that Captain America review. And yeah, definitely a big turning point for the MCU when it comes to the falling of S.H.I.E.L.D. And yeah, it'll definitely be crazy moving forward for the Avengers characters. Oh yeah, and I forgot to mention the mid credit scene of Baron Von Strucker and his you know science assistant doing those scientific experiments on who gets revealed to be Pietro and Wanda Maximoff. And Pietro has like super speed and then Wanda has kind of like telekinetic powers. So it's really cool seeing that established in this one. And then obviously they'll become very important in Avengers Age of Ultron where they become enemies and then turn allies. So it's cool seeing them in this post credit scene to establish that and then kind of establishes the whole mission that the Avengers have to go on in order to retrieve the scepter because it gets revealed in Infinity War that some of the agents who were actually sleeper agents for Hydra intercepted the scepter and then gave it to Von Strucker in order to use the Mind Stone in order to give powers to the twins, you know, the Age of Miracles and whatnot. So it's cool having it established in this movie and then having that kind of tie in in Endgame to figure out like how this all happened. But yeah, great little Easter egg at the end and then kind of leads us into Age of Ultron. Before Age of Ultron, we have Guardians of the Galaxy. Again, another one of my favorite movies of all time, just like Iron Man, not just one of my favorite superhero movies or Marvel movies, just one of my favorite movies of all time. And when they first announced it, it was just like, wait, Guardians of the Galaxy? Like, wait, what? There's like a talking raccoon and a talking giant tree? Like, wait, what the heck? How are they going to do this? Like, you just had this amazing movie with Winter Soldier, and now you're suddenly having these goofballs. You know, you have Chris Pratt, the chubby guy from Parks and Rec is the main character. Like, what, how are you going to do this? But you know, obviously, James Gunn and the cast and crew, you know, proved us all wrong. You know, that first trailer dropped with the whole hooked on a feeling the soundtrack you just knew that this was going to be completely different and you know something unique and iconic in a way but yeah you know right off the bat we're kind of introduced to the character of Peter Quill and how his mother Meredith Quill is dying and how he feels this guilt because you know he didn't take her hand when she offered it to him and offers him you know this present beforehand it's this kind of like thing that he holds on you know he never wants to open it because he doesn't want to feel that guilt that he has for not taking his mom's hand and then after his mom dies he kind of rushes outside and then gets abducted by Yondu and then Yondu obviously revealed to be like a trickster character. You think he's going to be like an enemy but then at the very end you know kind of jumping all over the place but he kind of reveals that he was supposed to deliver Peter Quill to his father and then you know obviously we'll get revealed later on that Peter's father is kind of like a godlike being and that Peter Quill is actually you know half human half celestial which gets revealed in volume two which we'll get to in a second and has all these abilities which get established later on when you know the guardians come together and they have to hold on to the power stone which gets revealed in this movie and you know they'll die because you know Peter has these extra abilities but then back to Yondu he refuses to take Peter to his dad because you know he was uh, another word for Tonki um, which gets revealed his whole attention in volume two but yeah so he gets abducted and then we get introduced to a slew of new characters who will become very important later on Korath who was working for a character named Rune the Accuser who's like the main villain with his giant hammer we get reintroduced to Thanos and then his two stepdaughters Nebula and Gamora who obviously become very important later on and we also have Rocket and Groot, some of my favorite characters of all time. Very Han Solo, Chewbacca type characters. And then Drax the Destroyer, whose family was killed by Ronin under the orders of Thanos. So that gives him his whole 
whole motivation to join the team. But yeah, overall, just like great space adventure. We get introduced to kind of like what I was saying earlier to the Power Stone, which is like the orb that Peter Quill is like after the beginning. It's revealed to be an Infinity Stone. And that's kind of like the MacGuffin throughout the movie that all the characters were trying to get. But then, you know, we kind of get to the big ending, like I was saying earlier, of Ronan putting the stone into his hammer and he's about to, you know, destroy this planet called Xandar, which is an establishment for this place called the Nova Corps, which is kind of like a warring faction with this other alien species called the Kree, which Ronan is a part of, which we'll get to more in Captain Marvel later on, that whole backstory. So he's about to destroy Xandar, but then Peter has, you know, the dance off, bro, <laughs> you and me. And then to distract him, meanwhile, like Rocket is making his little gun to fire at the hammer. The hammer gets destroyed. The power stone is like flying. Peter slow motion tries to grab it, you know, grabs it. And then he's obviously being affected by it. And then, you know, the only way to ease that pain is to kind of distribute it among the other characters. So then they're all working together to distribute the power and they use it to defeat Ronin. We get that earlier scene where Tavon, the collector, is telling them all the whole backstory about the Infinity Stones. And he was a character that was established in Thor the Dark World. That was like one of the few essential things from Thor the Dark World is the post credit scene where the collector takes the reality stone, which will get brought up again in Infinity War. And it was like after the power stone, but then his assistant, Karina, grabs the Infinity Stone, blows everything up, and then the Guardians escape. But yeah, coming back to the ending, they defeat Ronin, their records are expunged because they were previously criminals, and they become the Guardians of the Galaxy, and you know, fly off into, you know, the twin sunset. And we have the fun post credit scene of like Baby Groot because that amazing scene before the Dark Aster is about to go down with the Guardians in it, you know, he kind of spreads his branches, protects the Guardians, and dies, but then Rocket keeps this little sapling, and then that grows up into potted Baby Groot who's dancing around everything, you know, iconic character, you know, see all those toys at the Disneyland store of like the dancing Groot or ones that you put on your shoulder or whatever. But yeah, overall, great movie, great soundtrack, great score, just fun jokes, just overall, just really fun movie. And it's really going to be cool to see how they finally get integrated into the Infinity War storyline, especially with Nebula and Gamora already having connection with Thanos and Drax in a way having a connection with Thanos as well. So it'll be cool seeing them once they finally do meet the Guardians and try to work together to defeat Thanos. All right, and then we move on to Avengers Age of Ultron. Again, not my favorite Avengers movie. It's probably my least favorite Avengers movie. Kind of like what I was saying with Iron Man 2, this kind of feels like the movie that kind of shoehorns in a lot of kind of like overall MCU stuff. Like rewatching it kind of flows a little bit better with the overall MCU, but I remember when I first saw it, it was just like, oh my gosh, like why is there so much going on? And it's just like, why can't it just be the Avengers vs. Ultron? Why are there all these different storylines and characters and stuff that doesn't really go anywhere? But yeah, we'll get to that in a bit. But yeah, it does establish a lot of important locations, like especially the nation of Zakovia, which we'll get important later on within the MCU. The whole opening action scene of the Avengers infiltrating the Hydra base in order to retrieve the scepter. But before they can defeat Strucker and all of his men, they get affected by the twins, Pietro and Wanda, who were in the post credit scene of Winter Soldier. It kind of, you know, keeps them on their toes. They're able to retreat the scepter, but then Wanda puts that whole spell on Tony Stark to make him see visions of the Battle of New York, bring back his PTSD from Iron Man 3, probably the only essential things from Iron Man 3. So then it kind of motivates him to recruit Bruce Banner in order to restore start the whole Ultron program to create a suit of armor around the world to protect themselves from cosmic threats so that if Thanos invades again, they'll be able to protect themselves. But then, you know, obviously things go wrong and Ultron gains sentience, kills Jarvis and puts his consciousness into damaged Iron Man drones and, you know, kind of escapes into the internet after he attacks the Avengers. This is like the new threat they have to face. In the comic books is actually, you know, Hank Pym who develops Ultron and, you know, he'll be introduced in Ant-Man, the next movie. But Joss Whedon really wanted to have have Tony Stark, who's responsible for Ultron, which I think was a, yeah, a good choice. And obviously there'll be repercussions as the movies goes on. Cause you know, I remember watching this movie, I'm just like, okay, it was like, really? Like the heroes are the ones who create the main villain, like, or how are they gonna deal with the repercussions? But you know, obviously we get more of that in Captain America Civil War. And we kind of have the cool midpoint scene after the Avengers fight off Ulysses Claw, another character who gets established in this movie, who becomes important later on in Black Panther. And then we also get a mention of Wakanda in this movie, which becomes important later after they defeat him they get infected by Wanda's like mind control and everything you know, they travel to Clint Barton's farmhouse and establish his family his family life which is really cool which obviously becomes his kind of motivation to kind of humanize the Avengers and you know kind of be more like that human perspective and then we have another storyline of Ultron wanting to evolve and in order to do that he has to create kind of like this synthetic body and that you know that ends up being Vision he's powered by the Mind Stone Ultron takes it from Loki's scepter puts it in Vision's forehead and obviously it's going to 
be a very important thing later on for Infinity War. You know, obviously Thanos is trying to collect all the Infinity Stones in order to wipe out all the universe. And in order to do that, they're going to have to remove it from Vision somehow. So there's going to be some tension kind of moving forward. But it's kind of cool seeing instead of having Ultron's AI to power Vision, Tony Stark and Bruce Banner put Jarvis, who apparently survived, put that into Jarvis's body so that he'd be sentient. And, you know, it's kind of cool seeing Paul Bettany. At first, he was just a voiceover throughout the MCU. And I never thought that he'd be, you know, a big part in it. But then he finally becomes part of the MCU as an actual character. So that was really cool. And then cut to the end battle where Ultron's ultimate plan is to wipe out all humanity. So then he puts all these different rockets around the country of Sokovia and then kind of lifts it up from the rest of the land and then wants it to, you know, smash it up to the ground to wipe out everything. And then we obviously have Wanda and Pietro turning against Ultron and join the Avengers. So yeah, we get to the end battle and obviously they defeat Ultron. They defeat all the drones. You know, they stop the meteor from happening. But then we kind of get all the fallout from that. We have character storylines. You know, we have Tony Stark wanting to be more of an administrator of the Avengers instead of fighting on the team just because we see how helpful he is to the team. We have Captain America and Black Widow, you know, becoming like the new leaders of the new Avengers. We have, you know, Sam Wilson, Vision, Wanda, War Machine. We have Clint who retires. And then we have Thor with this whole kind of side quest of Hot Tub Thor Machine, as people call it, of him going to like the little hot tub and then seeing visions of Ragnarok and visions of the Infinity Stones and, you know, potentially Thanos taking over the world. So then, you know, he decides to leave the Avengers and kind of go off on his own journey to find out more about the Stones. And then obviously we have Hulk who just wants to live a normal life and obviously he can't get that because, you know, when does he ever get what he wants? So he decides to just kind of like fly off in the Quinjet and then, you know, he gets reintroduced into Ragnarok, which is really cool seeing where he ends up. But so yeah, all the Avengers kind of go their separate ways, whether voluntarily or not. And yeah, it definitely kind of leaves the MCU and like, what are we going to do now? It's definitely a new chapter in the MCU for sure. And then, you know, obviously the mid credit scene of Thanos going into his vault, putting on the Infinity Gauntlet and saying, fine. I'll do it myself. So it's like, oh shoot, what's he gonna do? He's finally getting out of his chair and doing something. So yeah, overall, I know there's like a lot of things when you watch this movie in isolation, it's like, oh my gosh, it's like too much going on, like what's happening. But then when you kind of watch it as a piece of the overall Infinity Saga, you say, okay, yeah, there's a lot of essential elements in this movie and it's not that bad. It's a little convoluted, but it's very essential. So yeah, I definitely give it a pass for that. And then we move on to Ant-Man, you know, after the huge stakes that we had in Age of Ultron, it's kind of cool to see more of a small movie, literally small movie with, you know, the shrinking technology and Pym Tech and whatnot. Again, another movie that introduces a lot of main characters that will be important later on. You know, you have Scott Lang, Hope Van Dyme, Hank, Janet in a flashback, Cassie and Louise. Yeah, just a lot of like really, really cool characters. You know, not characters that are like super important to the MCU, but you know, important to like their own universes and the whole Ant-Man universe. I think like the main thing that's really important in this movie is like the establishment of Ant-Man, you know, as a hero, you know, Scott Lang's version of Ant-Man as a hero, which will become important later on in the movies especially you know the whole mission where he has to get the tech from the Avengers facility and they think it's like oh it's like an old warehouse or something but it actually turns out to be the Avengers campus and you know while all the Avengers are off on their missions Falcon is left house sitting so Falcon and Ant-Man have their whole interaction their whole fight after Ant-Man kind of defeats Falcon and steals the tech that kind of impresses Falcon and then he's like hey maybe I should recruit him to the Avengers sometime if we ever have like a world ending mission or you know like a brainwashed super soldier that we need to find and defeat so I think that's really like one of the few essential elements to Ant-Man that ties into the overall MCU is that whole kind of crossover event and then obviously the kind of jumping around but like the post credit scene where we get that scene from Civil War where Cap and Falcon are in that warehouse and they have Bucky subdued as his arm trapped and then you know they need help to protect Bucky and then you know Falcon's like I know a guy. So I think that was a really cool tie into the overall MCU. And another thing is probably like the establishment of the quantum realm, which will definitely come essential later on in Endgame. So it's cool seeing this establish and then bring up the whole storyline of Janet Van Dyne being trapped in the quantum realm, you know, because there's a whole mission of she and Hank Pym having to stop that missile. Janet used her regulator to shrink down beyond the molecules and destroy the missile, disable it. But then, you know, she kept shrinking down and down and down until she was in the quantum realm. So she got trapped and that started the whole estrangement between Hank Pym and Hope Van Dyme, their daughter. And then as this mission goes on, you know, the relationship kind of gets mended. And then we get like the mid cred scene of Hank showing Hope the kind of prototype wasp armor because originally Janet was the wasp. And then obviously we'll get Ant-Man and the wasp later on. Um, we'll get to that in a second. And yeah, we get that also that Easter egg at the beginning where young Hank Pym is talking with an older Howard Stark and Peggy Carter continuing the S.H.I.E.L.D. program and everything like that. So the overall, there's like a few Easter eggs here and there that tie into the overall MC 
MCU, but I, mean, I know it was like their intention, you know, Peyton Reed and Marvel is to have like a smaller, more self-contained movie after that kind of huge, almost world ending event of Age of Ultron. So yeah, I totally understand like why they wanted to do what they do with it. Yeah, like overall, like, I think it's a fun family movie, especially watching it as a dad. It's like you do anything for your kids. So it's kind of cool seeing all these dads <laughs> trying to do what they can for their kids and everything like that. Yeah, even though unfortunately Edgar Wright didn't direct it, but glad that he got like a little story credit. I mean, it would have been cool to see Edgar Wright's vision because he's one of my favorite filmmakers of all time. So it would have been cool to see that. But you know, Peyton Reed did a good job. Paul Rudd does a great job as well. And yeah, overall fun movie. And yeah, we'll see what happens now that that's the end of phase two, how everything's going to be going on in phase three. So then we wanted Captain America Civil War, you know, what a way to start. Again, I've done another video where I express all my thoughts on Civil War. So yeah, go ahead and check that one out for my full breakdown of it. But yeah, for this video, it's definitely continues the whole storyline that was set in motion in Winter Soldier of Bucky being the central figure of this movie. And you know, one of the inciting incidents is him killing Tony Stark's parents and then stealing the super soldier serum for Hydra for their base in Siberia. And definitely a lot of like Easter eggs kind of gets brought up back at the very end of the movie with the character of Helmet Zemo playing that footage for Tony, Steve, and Bucky. I think it's a whole reveal because his whole motivation is to fracture the Avengers because of what happened in Sokovia where Zemo's family was killed in that battle and you know he's trying to get revenge because he's just a normal guy. He can't go against the Avengers but he got them to kill each other. Maybe that would work so he decides to have the whole plan in motion and then meanwhile you have the Avengers need to be put in check because the whole opening action scene of the new Avengers team going against Crossbones in Lagos and Brock Romlo, who turns out to be Crossbones, tries to have like a suicide bomb, but then Wanda contains the power, tries to throw him up, and then blows up the building with all the Wakandan refugees, and that kind of sets things in motion for the Sokovia Accords. So obviously the Avengers are divided over that, and Tony and his team want the Avengers to be put in check, but then Steve wants to have the Avengers kind of make their own choices. Then we have the Civil War, as it says in the movie. We also get introduced to a bunch of new characters. We get introduced to Black Panther and his father T'Chaka, and then after T'Chaka gets killed, Black Panther becomes the new King of Wakanda and the new Black Panther. And then he'll get into his movie later on. We get introduced to Ayo, Adore Milaje, kind of like the all-female warrior for Wakanda. We get introduced to Everett Ross, played by Martin Freeman, which we'll get reintroduced again in Black Panther. And then we get introduced to Peter Parker, played by Tom Holland, and then Aunt May, played by Marissa Tomei. And then we're kind of establishing this kind of new Avengers team since Thor and Hulk are kind of out of the picture. Now we have to introduce like new heroes into the MCU in order to kind of like fill the roster a little bit. It's kind of cool seeing these new characters introduced, you know, especially as they get recruited and then kind of seeing how they, you know, spin off. Obviously they have the big battle at the airport, which is epic and amazing. And then, you know, kind of like the plot twist within that, Black Widow ends up betraying Tony and you kind of subdues Black Panther to let Steve and Bucky go free. War Machine tries to go after them and then Falcon tries to stop War Machine, but then Vision tries to shoot down Falcon, but then, you know, accidentally hits War Machine. So then is his suit's disabled, he falls down to the ground, gets paralyzed, and then, you know, all the other characters are kind of like at a stalemate. They either just don't want to help Tony anymore, or they've just been kind of subdued in a way. And we get to the big ending, where we have the big fight between Steve, Iron Man, and Bucky, where it kind of like ends with Bucky getting his arm blown off, and then Cap using the shield to disable Iron Man's suit, and then them kind of like going off and <laughs> leaving Iron Man hanging. Cap's team gets captured and taken to the raft, but then at the very end, you know, Steve breaks them out, and they're kind of on the run, and then Tony's really just like left hanging, but then he gets the cell phone in the mail. Steve has a voiceover. It's like, if you ever need me, I'll be there. So even though the Avengers are fractured, Captain America still wants to have, you know, reconciliation with Tony because, you know, there might be a big world ending threat later on. So they might have to reassemble in order to defeat it. So yeah, overall, this is like an amazing movie. Action packed, funny, dramatic. And it's definitely a good like midpoint of the entire MCU. Like everything's kind of flipped on its head. Tony is like wanting to be put in check where at first he was like wanting to just do everything for himself and be selfish. And Steve, who was always like, pro-government, pro-authority, and everything like that is now going on his own, going on the run. So definitely a big midpoint for the MCU. And yeah, it just definitely kind of leaves the Avengers team in shambles. And then that's kind of like a great opportunity for Thanos to come in and start taking over. So yeah, overall, awesome movie. Oh yeah, and I forgot to mention the mid credit scene of Bucky being taken to Wakanda and then putting into cryo sleep and then starting their whole rehabilitation process to go from Winter Soldier to Bucky and then, you know, having Cap have a whole trusting relationship with T'Challa and then kind of set up their relationship for Infinity War and later on. 
And then we move on to Doctor Strange. And this is like another one that's kind of more of like a self-contained story, you know, especially after the craziness of Civil War. It's kind of like after Age of Ultron, we get Ant-Man. You know, after Civil War, we get Doctor Strange, where it's kind of like more of like a self-contained story that obviously, like I said, with other movies, there's some essential elements to it. Obviously, the biggest one is the introduction of the character of Doctor Strange into the MCU. So obviously, he becomes a very important character. He first starts off at being this kind of like selfish neurosurgeon, and then he gets an accident that crushes his hands. And he's trying to find ways to fix them so then he goes to Carmitage because he learned about a person beforehand who went there and you know healed himself so he goes there and then gets introduced to the ancient one another important character who will get established later on especially in Endgame played by Tilda Swinton and he learns about different dimensions you know he learns about the dark dimension the mirror dimension all these different like sorcery techniques and then you know as the story goes on he learns about this character named Caecilius who steals a spell from the opening scene in order to open up the dark dimension and have Dormammu kind of take over the world because he believes that you know time is the enemy and then if they go to the dark dimension there's no concept of time there so it thinks like that's the best way that they need to go towards and obviously Doctor Strange disagrees with that so as the story goes on he learns more about the mystic arts gets all these different trinkets and everything you know he gets like his sling ring he gets you know the cloak of levitation which becomes essential later on you know he gets the eye of Agamotto which later is revealed to be an infinity stone which is the time stone you know he can like reverse time you know fast forward time time loops and they have a whole big battle where he's using the Ayak Moto when he confronts Dormammu. He's like, Dormammu, I've come to bargain. And, you know, he has the time loop over and over and over again. And in order to break it, he says, okay, you need to take Caecilius and his acolytes away to the dark dimension and kind of leave Earth alone. So he becomes the next Sorcerer Supreme, watches over the New York Sanctum, because there's three different sanctums that protect the overall universe, one in London and then one also in Hong Kong. And he allies with the character Wong, played by Bendik Wong. <laughs> thought that was pretty funny. And then, you know, they work together at the New York Sanctum to protect it from world-ending threats. And then obviously we get that mid cred scene of Thor coming to the Sanctum Sanctorum in order to find Odin, which is a scene that gets more context in Thor Ragnarok. But then that's kind of like the unofficial way of Doctor Strange being brought into the MCU overall. So yeah, overall, again, it's kind of essential because Doctor Strange is a very essential character. He has one of the Infinity Stones. He's a protector of all the realms. And it's kind of one of those movies you know you kind of have to have a typical Marvel origin story. And yeah, this movie is like really, really fast paced, actually. Obviously, I know Doctor Strange is a very intelligent character and, you know, he can learn things really quickly. But I thought this was like, dang, this is like a really fast paced movie. It's like under two hours and he's already like a master by the end of it. But overall, yeah, typical Marvel origin story. And yeah, I thought it was pretty good and be cool to see what he does in Infinity War and then Endgame. All right, now we move on to Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. Again, another movie that's kind of more self-contained, but it definitely within its own universe. It kind of continues storylines from the previous movie and then resolves them and then kind of sets stories in motion for the next couple movies that the Guardians appear in. Obviously, the biggest one is probably with the introduction of the character of Ego at the very beginning and this whole kind of backstory of him, you know, being a living planet and then wanting to take over the universe by impregnating all these different women from these different planets, planting these different seeds in the ground and then having their offspring hopefully carry on the celestial gene because it turns out that Ego isn't powerful enough to take over the universe. He needs another celestial who carries on the gene in order to activate all these different plants that are in the ground, create these different blob monsters and take over the universe. But none of them succeeded so we end up killing off all those offspring. And then the one person that actually did it was Peter Quill. So that whole storyline that we had in Guardians 1 where it turned out that he's actually half celestial carries on that gene. So we have this whole mission from Ego to seek out Peter Quill, recruit him in order to activate these different pods that are around the universe and take it over. So it's kind of like this twisted father-son story in a way. And then we also get the revelation that Yondu was trying to keep Peter Quill from Ego to prevent all this from happening. But then Yondu kind of gets banished from the Ravengers because of all this, because of child trafficking. So it's definitely kind of like a stepfather-son story, which is definitely an interesting dynamic. Yeah, overall, I think this is like a more emotional movie than the previous one. Like, I don't like this movie as much as the previous one. I think the first one was a little bit more well-balanced. This is kind of more on the extremes. It's like, everything gets turned up to 100. It's like, okay, you want an emotional scene? We'll have all these emotional scenes. You want a funny scene? We'll keep throwing all these jokes at you. You want action? Here you go. We're going to tile up to 11. So I don't feel like it's as balanced as the first one. But I do think like the whole heart of the story is really good, you know, especially the whole twist at the end where it kind of gets revealed of this whole plan for Ego and the fact that Ego loved the mom so much, but he didn't want to have to keep going on Earth because he had this whole mission of destroying it. 
So he put a tumor in her head to cause her to die, and that kicks us right back to the opening scene of the first one. So then obviously Quill's upset and then tries to destroy Ego. The Guardians have to unite in order to defeat him, and they eventually do. Yondu comes in. We get the cool line of like, I'm Mary Poppins, y'all. <laughs> gives a whole sacrifice and allows Quill to live. We also get like a really cool resolution scene between Nebula and Gamora because you get the whole reveal that Thanos would always cause them to battle each other and every time Nebula and Gamora would go against each other, Nebula would lose and every time she lost, Thanos would replace a part of her with a robotic part so now she's like mostly machine now so she wants revenge but then they have their whole reconciliation so that's a really really nice scene for sure and that, that kind of like starts her quest to kill Thanos later on and then that'll definitely be a big part of Infinity War and Endgame. We also get introduced to the character Mantis, the empath character, and she'll definitely become essential in Infinity War and then post-Infinity Saga. But yeah, overall, you know, I thought it was like a good movie. I would say it looks like above average movie. Definitely not, in my opinion, as good as the first one, but yeah, I definitely think it has a lot of great scenes, a lot of great heart, some mostly good humor, and then a lot of essential elements for the overall Infinity Saga. So yeah, recommend. Then move on to Spider-Man Homecoming. And yeah, this is another one that very much self-contained. The only thing is that kind of continues storyline set up from Civil War where Peter Parker was introduced where obviously he gets recruited by Tony Stark to fight against Cap's team and then he has this whole thing where he's trying to get the call from Tony Stark and from Happy Hogan in order to become an Avenger officially but they keep ignoring his calls so he kind of tries to be like a friendly neighborhood Spider-Man kind of tries to solve crimes on his own but you know he kind of makes things worse and then it puts a strain on the whole relationship between him and Tony Stark and you know it's definitely another kind of father-son story you know he even Tony even has this it's like gosh I'm starting to sound like my father. So I, I think like the only really essential thing is the whole kind of relationship between Tony Stark and Peter Parker, especially, you know, Tony Stark is giving Peter Parker all this Spider-Man technology and this amazing suit, which is, you know, in my opinion, kind of a bummer because, you know, what I like about the Spider-Man comics is the fact that Peter Parker's poor and, you know, he really has to use his wits and his own like abilities to defeat his enemies. He's not like Tony Stark or Batman or something where he can just use his money in order to solve all his problems. He really has to rely on himself in order to do it. I don't mind like this Peter Parker has like a mentor character because you know we don't really have that in other Spider-Man movies and the fact that Tom Holland he actually looks like a teenager now, I know he was like 20 years old when he filmed this but he looks like he's 16 17 years old so they really did a good job at making him be like a younger Spider-Man especially the fact that it's set in high school and you know this one and the next one you know set in high school and the third one as well but yeah this one's definitely set in high school so it's definitely more like that John Hughes feel and we have the other characters Ned and MJ who get more established as movies go on which are great characters but yeah overall yeah it's a good movie and then you know get to the ending where Peter defeats the vulture, he gets sent off to prison, and then Peter Parker kind of proves himself to be an Avenger in a way, so then Tony Stark ends up giving Peter back the suit that he took because, like, halfway point, you know, he tries to use the suit when he tries to stop the vulture's men, causes the fairy to split in half, so then Tony takes the suit, but then at the ending where he proves himself, he gives it back, and wants to have this whole press conference in order to announce him as an Avenger, he shows, like, the whole Iron Spider suit, which gets established more in Infinity War, but then Peter's just like, I just want to be a friendly neighborhood Spider-Man, you know, which is probably the better choice he dons the suit and then Aunt May comes into the room and it's like what the <laughs> and then cut end credits so yeah overall yeah really fun movie some essential elements in it some things that carry on from previous MCU movies and then set up for Infinity War and Endgame and then Far From Home but yeah overall yeah it was good and can't wait to see what he does in the rest of the MCU alright now we move on to Thor Ragnarok and yeah this is definitely another movie where a lot <laughs> happens you know we're kind of continuing the storylines that were previously established at the end of Age of Ultron where Thor gets the visions of Ragnarok and the world ending things so he decides to find out more about the Infinity Stones, but then we kind of end that storyline and then we kind of focus more on Ragnarok. So we have Thor kind of in the custody of Surtur, but obviously he breaks free, defeats Surtur, thinking that he ended Ragnarok and then takes the crown with him back to Asgard. But then when he comes back to Asgard, he sees that Loki is in disguise as Odin. He's taken over. Heimdall's nowhere to be seen. And now this new character named Scourge is now in charge of the Bifrost, the rainbow bridge that is a way for the Asgardians to teleport anywhere in the universe. So he He's like, wait, what the heck's going on? But kind of suspects that Loki's doing some trickery. He exposes Odin as actually Loki in disguise. And then they have this whole mission in order to actually find Odin to find out like what's going on. They go to Earth because they get in contact with Doctor Strange. And that scene was previously established at the end of Doctor Strange in the whole mid credit scene and how they need to find Odin so that he can rule Asgard again. And then we get the whole plot twist that he's actually in Norway and that there's this whole secret that he's been keeping. The fact that he was actually a conqueror with Hela, played by Kate. 
Blanchett, who's Thor and Loki's sister, and that they were conquerors, but then Hela just wanted power, so then Odin imprisoned her, but then if Odin dies, then she'll be released, so that he dies and then fades away, and then Hela gets established. Loki and Thor are trying to get back to Asgard, and they open the Bifrost, but then Hela gets transported back to Asgard, and wipes all the Warriors 3 and all these different important characters out, and becomes the new ruler of Asgard, while Thor and Loki are sent to a planet of Sakaar, and you know, they're separated, and Thor is like, the whole journey is like him trying to get back to Asgard, gets captured by Scrapper 142, who turns out to be Valkyrie, who is important later on, and then taken to the Grandmaster, played by Jeff Goldblum, who puts him into the concept of champions, and in order to buy his way out of Sakaar, he has to defeat the champion, who turns out to be the Hulk, who gets revealed after he went off to the Gwinjet, crashed onto Sakaar, and became the Grandmaster's champion. So they fight, but then kind of becomes like a stalemate, because Thor uses the power, because the God of Thunder, to defeat Hulk, but then, you know, he gets this control chip on his neck, and then that gets activated, and he gets subdued. So then he wakes up, meets up with Hulk again. Hulk tells him about that the Quinjet is out in the scrapyard, he goes into the Quinjet. Hulk follows him, sees the message from Nat, and then he transformed back into Bruce Banner, and then they team up with Loki and Valkyrie to board one of the pleasure vessels in order to get back to Asgard. They recruit Korg and Meek to start a revolution and come back to Asgard. Loki tries to betray him, so Thor puts the whole controller ship on his neck and like subdues him. So then Thor, Valkyrie, and Hulk go back to Asgard. They finally challenge Hela, but then obviously she's too powerful. So then she like cuts out Thor's eye, and then Thor has the vision of Odin saying that they have to just start up Ragnarok in order to defeat Hela. So then Loki returns with Korg and Meek and the revolutionaries and they fight Hela's army. But then Thor tells Loki to put Surtur's helmet into the Eternal Flame to start off Ragnarok. And then in Odin's vault, he sees the Tesseract and then he swipes that. So then Surtur's reborn, plants his sword into Ragnarok. It gets destroyed. Hela's killed off. And all the Asgardians are sent on to the Statesmen. And they kind of fly away from Asgard. And then Thor has the whole idea of like going back to Earth to establish a new Asgard. And I think it's going to be a happy ending. But then we get to the mid credit scene of Thanos' ship, the Sanctuary 2, kind of rising up in front of them. And they're kind of like, oh, shoot. And then that kind of leads us into Infinity War. But before we get to Infinity War, we have Black Panther, which I kind of wish that we kind of reversed it. I kind of wish we had Black Panther and then Thor Ragnarok, because then Thor Ragnarok can lead right into Infinity War. But yeah. Oh well. So that's the end of Thor Ragnarok. And then yeah, it's definitely, you know, overall just one of my favorite movies of all time. I'm glad they finally made Thor fun again. And I'm glad they kind of somewhat kept that tone for the future movies. But yeah, overall, great, great movie. All right. And then we move on to Black Panther. And yeah, Black Panther is definitely another big movie within not only the MCU, but just pop culture in general with being like the first black director for the MCU and then mostly all black cast and then just the cultural phenomenon that it did for African-Americans and everything that it did for box office wise. Academy Awards, historically, culturally significant movie, and first superhero movie, first Marvel movie to be nominated for an Oscar for Best Picture. So yeah, overall, I think it's really, really cool how that was all established. But yeah, to get into the movie itself, you know, right off the bat, we have the whole backstory of how Vibranium was like a meteor that was in space that kind of crashed down into Earth, not only Earth, but also within the heart of Africa, and then how the Wakandans used the Vibranium to start up the technology to kind of make their society more advanced. So I thought that was really cool to finally see that backstory. And then this movie kind of takes place a couple days after the whole fallout of Civil War, where in that movie, King T'Chaka was killed off by Baron Zemo in an explosion during the whole UN signing, and how T'Challa had to become the new Black Panther and the new King of Wakanda. And the whole first like half hours, like the whole ritual process of going to like Warrior Falls and having to challenge different tribal leaders for a title of Black Panther, meeting the new characters like M'Baku, who challenges him, who T'Challa defeats and retains his title of Black Panther. We have like Nakia and Okoye and Shuri and Ramonda and all these different characters will become important later on. And yeah, it's kind of cool just seeing like the whole just kind of like Wakandan culture of like how someone becomes Black Panther, how they drink the heart-shaped herb and they go to the ancestral plane and then meet their different ancestors to get like advice. So I thought that was really cool. We also get reintroduced to previously established characters like Ulysses Claw, who was established in Age of Ultron. We get his whole resolution. And then we also get introduced to the character of Killmonger and how his father, Njobu was working together with Claw in order to transport weapons from Wakanda to the U.S. in order to have African American people be able to protect themselves from the man. So that was an interesting door in line. But then obviously, you know, we get to the midway point where Killmonger ends up killing Claw and his other teammates and then uses his body as a way to get into Wakanda and how he kind of reveals himself as being the son of Njobu and that how he has a right for the throne and how he challenges 
challenges T'Challa in the ritual combat, defeats him, and then becomes a new king, and then how things go awry after that. But yeah, I think I like the first half more than the second half. But once we have that kind of whole camera motion of things going upside down, it's like I was really on Killmonger's side, and after that, kind of just went crazy with power, and then just wanted to you know take over the world, which is kind of a bummer. Because after that, it just kind of comes like a total Marvel movie where you know we have like the good guys and the bad guys fighting each other, and then T'Challa finally defeats Killmonger in a pretty bad CGI battle, but then understands his whole position. Something that Nikhil was saying all along was that we should open our borders to the rest of the world and then share our resources with them because we're this advanced society. We shouldn't just keep everything hidden with ourselves. We need to share it with the rest of the world. So then Black Panther and Koye and Nakia go before the UN and then tell the rest of the world that Wakanda isn't just this third world country, that it's actually this thriving, prosperous nation. We're going to share our resources with the rest of the world. And the very end where T'Challa and Shuri are kind of looking at the old apartment that Njobu was killed in by T'Chaka and we're going to make it a resource center and we're going to provide resources for these kind of impoverished neighborhoods. And I thought that was a really cool ending, really cool theme that they established in this and, you know, kind of establishes T'Challa as this, you know, amazing hero. That little boy at the very end, he was like, who are you? And he kind of just like smiles. Tony Stark would probably say, I am Iron Man, but T'Challa has this very like humbleness and he's just kind of like just grinning and just accepting it. So I thought, yeah, overall, amazing movie. And then obviously we have the post credit scene of Shuri and Bucky doing the whole rehabilitation process and then him becoming you know, the White Wolf who gets brought up later on in Infinity War. So it's kind of cool seeing that whole time and connection because obviously we get into Infinity War in the next movie and then the Wakandans are going to become a very important part of that. So it's kind of cool seeing it being established in this movie and then getting the payoff in Infinity War. And then we finally get into Infinity War. Kind of like what I was saying with other videos, if you want to see my full thoughts of Infinity War, you can watch that previous video. But for this one, it's like the part one of the culmination of everything that's been going on in the MCU thus far, of like Thanos' quest to find all six Infinity Stones right off the bat. He has the Power Stone, wipes out the ship that Thor and the rest of the Asgardians were trying to flee from at the end of Thor Ragnarok. And then he wipes out Loki and Heimdall, takes the Tesseract, which has the Space Stone in it, takes that. He goes to nowhere. And then we kind of get the recruitment of the Guardians characters with the Avengers. We get Quill, Drax, Gamora, and Mantis going to nowhere with the Collector, seeing that's been wiped out. On that, Thanos has the Reality Stone, kidnaps Gamora, takes her to Voromir because we get reintroduced to Nebula, who Thanos tortures for information, and then Gamora kind of spills the beans of where it is. So they go to Voromir, and then we get reintroduced to Red Skull, who I said previously got transported at the end of the events of First Avenger, where you think, wait, is he dead? Is he not? I don't know. And then it's like, turns out he just got teleported to Voromir to be the keeper of the Soul Stone. And then we get the whole reveal that in order to retrieve the stone, you have to sacrifice somebody you love. And then, you know, we get those flashbacks of Thanos meeting up with little Gamora, raising her after he just wiped out half her people and loved her like a daughter. So then he sacrifices her, gets the Soul Stone, and then kind of come back to the other Avengers who are trying to protect Vision because obviously he has the Mind Stone within his forehead. So then Cap, Natasha, and Falcon, who are on the run, save Vision and Wanda, who are trying to go into hiding in Scotland and save them from the children of Thanos, who are really cool characters as well. And then on the flip side, you have the other children of Thanos trying to go after Doctor Strange because he has a time stone, but Ebony Maw can't grab the Infinity Stone because of the predictive spell, so they decide to kidnap him. And then we get Tony Stark and Spider-Man trying to save him, so they defeat Ebony Maw, end up on Titan, meet Quill, Mantis, and Drax, who was told by Nebula that they'd be going to Titan. So then all those characters meet up with each other, try to defeat Thanos, but then they can't. Then Doctor Strange ends up giving up the time stone because he sees all like the 16 million different futures and they said that there's only one where they actually win and in that future he ends up giving up the time stone so that's what he ends up doing so then Thanos has five stones he goes to Wakanda because that's where the Avengers think that that would be the safest place for him because that's where Shuri will have the technology to remove the mind stone from vision but obviously it's too late Thanos comes they defeat his army but Thanos is too powerful because he has five stones Wanda tries to stop Thanos but then ends up destroying the mind stone within vision and he thinks it's going to be over but then since Thanos has the time stone he reverses time reassembles vision after he's been blown up takes the mind stone puts it into his gauntlet and then he has all six stones and he's about to snap his fingers but then Thor comes out of nowhere and tries to defeat him because he had his whole side quest in order to get a new hammer because in Thor Ragnarok Mjolnir was destroyed so now he needs a new hammer and as Stormbreaker puts the axe in his chest but Thanos has that cool line like you should have gone for the head 
and then snaps, and then half the universe gets wiped out. Thanos transports himself to the farm planet, and then kind of sits on the steps, and then looks off to a grateful universe. And then the Avengers are left hanging, and then it's just like, oh shoot, what do we do? And then we get the whole post credit scene at the very end, where Nick Fury and Murray Hill are driving the car, and half the universe is being wiped out. Murray Hill turns to dust, and then as Nick Fury is being turned to dust, he pulls out the pager, presses the button to activate it, and then he turns to dust, falls on the ground, and the camera zooms in on it, and you see the whole Captain Marvel logo, and then obviously it sets the character of Captain Marvel, which we'll get to in the next movie. But yeah, overall, great movie. Definitely felt like the Empire Strikes Back of the MCU, or you know, kind of leaving the theater and just like, what did I just see? What, what do I do now? And I was like, just got to wait another year. So yeah, overall, great movie. And then we'll get into the side adventures with the other movies to get us prepared for Endgame. And then we get into Ant-Man the Wasp, and again, with going from Age of Ultron to Ant-Man, we kind of have the same thing with going from Infinity War to Ant-Man the Wasp. Again, another self-contained movie with just a few essential elements in it. It's definitely a continuation of what happened after the events of Civil War, where after the whole fallout of the Sokovia Accords, Scott Lang is put under house arrest, and he's trying to find things to do, but then he gets recruited by Hank and Hope, because Hank and Hope are trying to open up the Quantum Realm. They're trying to find Janet, who's trapped in there, because in Ant-Man, at the very end, when he's battling Yellow Jacket, he gets trapped in the Quantum Realm, using his regulator to shrink between the molecules within Yellow Jacket's suit in order to disable it. Then he ends up putting the quantum realm, but then he puts a little growing device in his regulator, activates it, and then returns from the quantum realm. So that kind of starts the whole process of Hank and Hope's journey to open the quantum realm. So once it's open, Scott has a connection with Janet, and that kind of whole starts the whole process of them recruiting Scott in order to find out if they can put a plan in motion to rescue Janet from the quantum realm. And then obviously hijinks ensue with, with Sonny Birch, and then with ghosts and all this stuff that's kind of bounces the story back and forth. But then overall, everything kind of gets resolved in the end. So he Birch is sent to prison for all his different crimes. Hank is able to go into the quantum realm and then retrieve Janet, and they're able to like work together with Ghost in order to help her with her phasing in and out disability and help her solidify. But yeah, then we get to like the main ending where Scott goes into the quantum realm in order to get quantum particles in order to help Ghost continue that whole process. But then after he gets all the particles and he's about to be sent out, we kind of cut back to Earth, and then Hope, Hank, and Janet have been disintegrated, and then now Scott's trapped in the quantum realm realm and it's like oh shoot what am I gonna do now and then obviously we get the answer in Endgame so yeah again like another kind of small movie not really too many essential things but yeah there's like a handful of things that are very important but yeah overall I think it's like a fun movie I think it's pretty much equal with the first movie I think I like the first one just a little bit more but I think this one's still you know fun family action movie with some essential elements so yeah overall yeah pretty good then we move on to Captain Marvel another kind of like self-contained story definitely establishes a lot of things within the MCU as Captain Marvel's the second Avenger in a way where she she was start off as like a fighter pilot and she was on this mission with Lawson in order to fly the ship to this sanctuary for the race called the Scrolls. And the Scrolls are like this kind of shape-shifting race. But then, you know, everything kind of goes wrong and the ship crash lands because this whole tension between the Kree and the Scrolls and the Kree were established in Gardens of the Galaxy. And then you have this character, Yon Rog, played by Jude Law, who's trying to stop Lawson because she's like a renegade Kree and he shoots down the plane. She's about to kill Lawson, but then Carol, played by Brie Larson who stands up to him and then he tries to destroy the core because the core is powered by the Tesseract which has obviously been established in previous movies. It's been you know taken from S.H.I.E.L.D. after the ending of Captain America where they're trying to search for Steve Rogers and they eventually find the Tesseract and keep it in their position and then that becomes Project Pegasus which is headed by Lawson which starts the whole program and then once Carol shoots the engine the engine explodes and then all the particles from the Tesseract wash over she becomes Captain Marvel or I guess in this case Veers and the career trying to use her powers for evil in order to wipe out the scrolls. They put the little inhibitor chip on the back of her head and Captain Marvel is trying to find out like who she is and where she belongs and then this had this whole mission of trying to kill off the scrolls but then Carol tries to escape but then gets captured by the scrolls and then they kind of tamper with her memories and then she figures out more about her backstory and her history and then as she tries to escape she lands on Earth and then bumps into young Nick Fury and then young Agent Coulson. It was kind of cool seeing the younger version of Samuel L. Jackson kind of like the diehard with the vengeance Nick Fury. So yeah, we kind of get more backstory of S.H.I.E.L.D. and the Kree and the Scroll War. So I think that's pretty essential for the overall MCU. And we get reintroduced to like Korath, who was a villain in Guardians of the Galaxy, and Ronan as well, seeing their whole like backstory being these Kree fanatics and whatnot, and like why they are the way they are once we get to Guardians of the Galaxy. So it was kind of cool seeing that. Then we also get introduced to the character of Talos, who's like a refugee of the Scrolls, and his whole motivation is to find a home for the 
scrolls. So he finally recruits Carol Danvers and then tells her about the whole backstory. Carol remembers everything that happened to her previously and then teams up with Talos and with Nick Fury in order to defeat Yon Rog and defeat the Supreme Intelligence in order to get the scrolls a safe home. So yeah, so they're definitely, again, more essential elements, more so that they will kind of be more important for like Spider-Man Far From Home, but not really for the overall Infinity Saga. The only real, I guess, essential elements for it are how S.H.I.E.L.D. got the Tesseract again because there's the whole character of Goose who turns out to be a flurkin who's like a cat who has these tentacles that come out of his mouth. He ends up ingesting the Tesseract and then gets brought back to Earth with Nick Fury. We get the whole explanation of how Nick Fury got the scar over his eye, which is like, eh, last time I trusted someone, I lost an eye. I'm trusting you not to eat me. So I guess that explains it. Still kind of dumb, but... Whatever, we get the establishment of the Protector Initiative, but then Nick Fury sees the photo of Carol Danvers and that her nickname was Avenger, so then kind of has that grin and then realize, oh, it's the Avenger Initiative. So yeah, again, there's like a lot of essential things that kind of set up the overall MCU. And then the last thing with the pager that Carol gives to Nick for emergencies only, which obviously he used in the last movie, in Infinity War, during this kind of world ending event. And then we get the mid credit scene of Steve and Natasha and Bruce and Rhodey trying to figure out like what's going on with this pager and they see like it stopped and like wait, what, what's going on with this and they kind of like turn around and then we see Carol Danvers in there just like where's Fury? So now Captain Marvel is finally within the Infinity Saga and then we'll see how essential she is for Endgame which we'll get to in a second. But overall yeah I think it's like a fine movie you know it wasn't my favorite when I first watched it but then watching it now seeing its place in the MCU so yeah I think it's still like a fine movie and you know does the job so yeah overall pretty good. All right, now we get into Endgame. Uh, again, if you want to see my full thoughts, you can watch my previous video uh, of Endgame, but I'll just like cut right to the chase with it. So obviously it's about the Avengers trying to reverse the events of Infinity War and find a way to bring everyone back. They have the whole mission of the beginning of them trying to go to Thanos' planet and like stop him, but then they have that whole revelation that use the stones to destroy the stones. They cut off Thanos' arm, Rocket rolls over the Infinity Gauntlet and sees that all the stones are destroyed. So they're like, no, what do we do? So then we kind of cut to five years later and the Avengers are trying to do the best they can with trying to go on like different missions in order to just try to help the world where half the population has been wiped out. And then we finally get to the scene where a rat scuttles across the dashboard of the van and then Ant-Man is brought back into real life. He sees it's been five years later. He goes to the Avengers and tells them about the whole quantum realm and how you can go from one point in time through the quantum realm and then go into another time. So they can use a time heist in order to get all the stones back in order to snap their fingers and then bring everybody back so then they recruit all the original Avengers, Tony Stark, Bruce Banner, Thor, Hawkeye. They also have Nebula and Rhodes and Rocket. They build the time machine, they go on the time heist and they kind of go on the different points in time in order to get all the stones and bring everybody back. We have Steve, Ant-Man, Tony and Bruce going after the three different Infinity Stones in New York. Tony and Ant-Man try to work together to get the Tesseract but then obviously things go wrong when the past Hulk comes in and knocks Tony to the side, knocks the Tesseract out of his hand after Steve Rogers gets the scepter from past Captain America during their whole fight. He and Tony have to go back to 1970 in order to get more pin particles and the Tesseract and then there Tony has this whole scene with his father and then Steve sees Peggy Carter through the window and then meanwhile Hulk meets up with the Ancient One and then gets the Time Stone from her and then tells her that after we use the stones in the future we'll bring him back to the past and put him back where they should be. And then we have Thor and Rocket going back to Thor the Dark world time making that movie essential and then Thor has this whole resolution with Frigga and then Rocket uses his device to extract the ether from Jane Foster and then meanwhile we have Rhodes and Nebula going after the Power Stone stealing it from Quill before he can get to it right before they transport back Nebula's kidnapped by 2014 Gamora Thanos and Nebula and they figure out like what the heck is going on they figure out that future Nebula is like working with the Avengers and they're trying to prevent something that he's done already so then Thanos Thanos tries to use the pin particles to transfer forward to the future where he can stop the Avengers from using all the stones to bring everybody back. And then also you have Barton and Natasha going up to the Soul Stone. And then as we established in Infinity War, in order to gain the stone, you have to sacrifice something you love. So then they fight over who's going to be the one to sacrifice themselves. And ultimately it's Black Widow and Clint gains the stone. So then all the heroes go back to the present. They put all the Infinity Stones within the gauntlet. And then Hulk, since the radiation from the gauntlet is mostly gamma he can handle it so he snaps his fingers and then you know, 
think everything's all good and then Thanos' ship crashes through the time machine and then destroys the Avengers compound and we have the whole final battle where it's the small team of Avengers going against Thanos and Nebula and then one by one the heroes are kind of like defeated. Cap has his last stand you know he summons Mjolnir which got established in Age of Ultron or he's trying to lift the hammer and then it's like eh, kind of squeaked a little bit. Fights Thanos but then Thanos is able to defeat him but Steve still tries to have his last stand and tries to go against Thanos and then you think all hope is lost when Thanos has his whole army that comes in but then you hear the hey Cap it's Sam on your left call back to Winter Soldier you know, turns and then all the different portals open up and then all the Marvel heroes throughout the entire MCU come in we have this whole army of heroes going against Thanos's army and then Cap has that like, iconic line of Avengers assemble you know something that he was gonna say in Age of Ultron but then Joss Whedon cut it off right when he was like Avengers <laughs> so it's cool seeing the armies clash. Eventually, Thanos gets the upper hand and then he gains the gauntlet because they're playing like hot potato with the gauntlet throughout the battlefield. Thanos gets gauntlet. Captain Marvel swoops in, tries to stop him, but then Thanos defeats her. Tony Stark goes in, secretly grabs all the stones, put them in his own glove, and then Thanos thinks he has the stones. He's about to say, I am inevitable. Snaps, nothing happens, and then cuts Tony, and then all the stones get put onto his wrist, and he's like, and I am. Iron Man and then snaps and then Thanos' armies gets defeated he gets defeated and then Tony Stark because the energy was just so great he ends up dying sacrificing his life it's like a call back to the first Avengers movie where Cap is saying to Tony like you're not the one to make the sacrifice play Let's lay on the wire and have someone crawl over you so Tony finally gives his life we kind of cut to his funeral where all the Avengers are there all the Avengers characters kind of go their separate ways Barton ends up retiring and then Thor ends up going with the Guardians to find Gamora and then leaves Valkyrie in his place to become the new king of Asgard. And then you have Steve, Sam, Bucky, and Hulk helping Steve go back in time to replace all the stones. But then he doesn't come back. And then Sam's like, where is he? Bring him back. And then Bucky, you know, sees elderly Steve in the distance. And then like I was saying earlier, Bucky turns to Sam and says, go ahead. Sam goes up to Steve. And then Steve gives Sam the shield to become the new Captain America. And then we cut to the past where Steve reunites with Peggy and they have their kiss and they have their dance because that was the whole thing that Steve was wanting to do back in the 1940s when he was like first in love with Peggy and had that date and they finally got their date and then cut to credits and yeah that's the unofficial end to the MCU we still have one film to go which is Spider-Man Far From Home which Kevin Feige says is the official end to the Infinity Saga but I personally think Endgame is the official ending but I understand you have to have like the Deumon scene of like the explanation of how people came back from the blip and how that affected society so I understand why Far From Home has to be like the official end but in my mind I think Endgame is the official and yeah definitely probably my favorite Avengers movie and then definitely one of my top movies within the MCU overall. Just emotion, the action, the stakes, the humor. Just, yeah, overall, it's just a very satisfying conclusion to this kind of like 22 film series that we had. And yeah, they definitely stuck the landing for sure. All right, and then we'll sort of wrap things up with Spider-Man Far From Home. And with this one, overall, yeah, it's like another fun movie. Definitely in tone with Spider-Man Homecoming, the way they established that. Yeah, definitely a continuation from what happened from the previous movie with Endgame of like everyone coming back from the blip five years later some people are five years older but then the people who came back are unaged so i think it's really fun that the school that peter goes to they decide to restart the year and have people who are older still within peter and ned's year but yeah it's just like an overall just fun summer movie kids going from different countries for their field trip and then in the meantime you have quindebec aka mysterio who's kind of like this new hero that everyone's admiring he's like from this multiverse and he's trying to fight off these things called elementals and he gets recruited by by Nick Fury and Maria Hill in order to have their help to defeat them. And then Nick Fury is trying to get Peter's help in order to help them defeat them. But then Peter's like, no, I just want to go on my field trip and I just want to ask MJ on a date and maybe get a kiss or something. So they definitely balance like the action and the humor. That's a very well balanced movie, kind of like with Homecoming. Then, you know, as the story goes on, Nick kind of takes control of the field trip. So then they can continue to kind of monitor Peter Parker and help him on all these different missions. So I thought that was really fun. But then we get the whole twist in the middle where Peter and Beck work together to defeat the fire elemental and then at the beginning of the movie Peter's very much mourning the loss of Tony Stark but then Tony gave him this device called Edith even dead I'm the hero which is these glasses that kind of control Stark Industries database and like their drone systems and whatnot and then the whole thing where Peter is just like a kid he doesn't think he's responsible enough so he gives Edith to Beck and then the whole twist of Beck not really being a hero it's all just an illusion all these different projections everything like the elementals all that was just a projection and that it's really like this whole front
want for the scheme that Beck has in order to take over Stark Industries because he's a disgruntled employee along with several other disgruntled employees. I think it was really cool that they had like one of the employees from the first Iron Man who was like being railed on by Obadiah Stane. He's like, Tony Stark was able to build this in a cave. Box of scraps. And then they kind of have a call back to Civil War where Tony Stark is having that presentation to the MIT students and he's she's showing them barf. And then Beck is obviously very upset about that because like he is the one who created that technology. And then Tony just took all the credit and gave this stupid name. So he's trying to get revenge on Tony and then take down Stark Industries and whatnot, take down Spider Man in order to do that. So then we obviously get to the very end where Peter and Happy Hogan and MJ and Ned and all the different heroes, Nick and Maria, are working together to defeat all the drones defeat Beck and then we have the happy ending MJ finds out that Peter Parker is Spider-Man and obviously Ned's known since the previous movie so now they all know and you think it's gonna be all good Peter Parker swinging through the city with MJ but then you get to the mid cred scene where Quentin reveals Peter's identity to the world and then obviously we'll see the fallout in the next Spider-Man movie but yeah overall I think it's definitely a fun movie definitely wraps up the Infinity Saga pretty well and then sets things in motion for phase four but it's very hit or miss phase along with you know phase five so yeah we'll talk about that one but yeah overall i think is a good way to kind of like wrap up the loose ends of the infinity saga you know especially with the fallout after the loss of tony stark and then explanation of what life's like after the blip so yeah i think overall it's like a good just wrap up to the movie i still think that endgame kind of gives a better resolution but i think this is a good like denouement to the infinity saga and kind of sets things in motion for what will happen in the future so that was my complete review of the marvel infinity saga this is probably the longest i've ever talked during a discussion video but i mean there's like 23 films worth to talk about so yeah a lot to go over but yeah overall i love marvel phases one through three i know there are some movies that are a lot better than others but i think overall they tell a really consistent story it's not you know the perfect story but i think like overall they did a really good job setting up these storylines these characters these themes and then kind of wrapping up in a satisfying conclusion and then changed the face of hollywood it's like the highest grossing franchise of all time and then every single franchise out there is trying to do like a crossover event with all these different characters but obviously not as successful as Marvel Cinematic Universe but I'm glad that within like my lifetime I got this great saga that I can like look back on and you know enjoy and you know make fun of and kind of get enthralled with gotta thank Kim Feige and Avi Arad and all the different producers and filmmakers of the MCU actors crew for making this amazing saga yeah I'm glad I was able to talk about it here but yeah thanks so much for watching this video what's your favorite Marvel movie what's your favorite movie from either the phases what's your favorite phase you know who's your favorite director favorite character favorite actor be sure to let me know in the comments below be sure to give this video a like and subscribe for more videos and i'll see you next time avengers awesome